And the Slow Factory is um, an organization that uh, has a global perspective and that positions itself from a, an internationalist point of view. So we do, we are based in the United States, but all of us come from the, are, all of us are from the global majority. So the perspective that we are sharing today is the perspective of uh, Lebanese, uh, the Lebanese perspective. And uh, we are going to be hearing from three uh, Lebanese um, thinkers and thought leaders and uh, academics and um, change makers that are really, um, changing the ways that we are um, understanding the issue and also providing a lot of insight for those of us who are in the diaspora to, to make, a, make an impact together. So that is the goal th today, uh, ahead of the elections and ahead of a lot of different things that are going to happen in Lebanon. Um, the goal of this uh, event today is to call home to get a sense of, to get a context of what's going on. So that is what we are going to, to be doing. I want to begin by introducing our panelists, our in, uh, guests, uh, with starting with Sara Al-Yafi. Um, uh, you know what, maybe each of you sh should introduce themselves really quickly because I really hate the reading a bio. It really is so clinical. So Sara Al-Yafi, there's Adib Dada and Charlel Hayek and if you want each of you at your own turn, uh, it, however it comes, just let's start with Sarah, just really quickly, like, what do you do? Who are you? And and then we will start with, uh, with the panel. Uh, okay, is, is my mic on? My mic is on, right? Yes. So uh, my name is uh, Sarah Yafi, and I am a public policy uh, consultant and a Lebanese political activist. I've been active in uh, for way longer than people have known. It started since my college years, and um, my expertise, my professional expertise, actually spans renewable energy. Uh, which is a sector that I worked in for many years. But in parallel, I was also constantly giving my thoughts and my opinions on the political um, scenery since uh, for a decade, for more than a decade now. And I believe this is what maybe most people know me for. And I am super excited to be here with you today. So thank you. Ahla sahla Charles. Charles is also on 3G network. So while his uh, video is, is uh, buffering, we lost him for a second. Charles, can you, can you introduce yourself? Okay, Adib. I'm back, I'm back. Oh, oh, oh he's back, he's back, okay. I'm back. My name is Charles Hayek. I'm a historian and a teacher. I'm all um, and Arab history and heritage on social media. And I'm also a fellow Slow Factory researcher. Yes. Adib, you want to do a quick intro? Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Adib Dada. I founded The Other Dada, which is an um, uh, environmental uh, consultancy and architecture firm. And I, um, I'm an environmental activist uh, known for my work on the Beirut River, which, uh, which we'll be seeing a bit later. And uh, so I, as part of this, I started an initiative called The Other Forest. So we'll be talking about that in a bit. That's for sure. Hello, Sahla Fikun. I'm Celine Samaran. I'm the, uh, um, one of the founders of the Slow Factory, one of the founding members. Uh, I run the Slow Factory with uh, our leadership collective. Uh, it's a distributed um, uh, organization. Um, as I said earlier, we are uh, from the perspective of uh, and working on uh, an internationalist approach for a global liberation around the world. And today we are hosting Calling Home, a symposium for Beirut to better understand the situation, to know how as a international community, as a diaspora, we can impact 
positive change. We want to understand it from three perspectives, from a political perspective, a historical perspective, and an environmental perspective, and how the weaponization of these three uh, sectors have been fundamental in uh, the ongoing chaos that is going on in Lebanon. So, Sarah, let's start with you. If you can give us uh, a little bit of a context from the political situation with the goal to inform the diaspora and our allies and to invite a collective action. Yes, of course. Uh, can we say that the time is a little fluid? I mean, if I if I overrun this because I have a lot to say, just let me... go for it. We have two hours. Let's okay. go. Okay, great. And it, and somebody said that my voice wasn't clear earlier. Is it clear right now? Um, is everybody hearing me? Okay. Yes, we hear you good. Okay, fantastic. So. Um, Honestly, Celine, I'm, I'm frankly delighted to be uh, amongst you today, uh, delighted to be hosted by uh, the Slow Factory, which is a platform that I not only love, but also respect and learn from. Um, delighted to be in such uh, good company with uh, Charles, our historian who I believe is famously disrupting our very barren and vain narrative and um, serving us growth through many inconvenient truths. and. Uh, maybe reminding everyone that the real cool kids are actually the smart and curious ones like him. Uh, also so happy to be with Adib. Uh, it's the first time I share a panel with him. I've known him since I was a kid. And, um, you know, for as long as I've known him, I, I, I always thought that his work was really generous and forward looking. And frankly, I think he's engaging in the only type of guerrilla warfare that should be acceptable today, which is guerrilla gardening. So, um, so, so truly privileged to be in such great company. And of course, Celine, you, the engaging voice of home away from home. So I mentioned earlier in my stories that I believe, Celine, you have the capacity to ask the right questions which honestly is the personification of real leadership, by the way. You sent us an introductory email uh, to us, the panelists, and upon describing the outline of the symposium, you wrote a sentence that particularly caught my attention, which you wrote, um, how did we get here like seriously? Which is simple and with the right note of despairing urgency, because seriously, how did we get here? And I will start, I will start by stating the date today. Today is August 28th, 2021. Today marks the 30th anniversary to the day of the amnesty law, law 84 slash 91 that was adopted on August 28th, 1991 that gave pardon to all Lebanese warlords that gave absolution to all political and wartime crimes including crimes against humanity crimes against human dignity, covering abduction, hostage taking, murders and massacres, all erased. Exempted from the law only were crimes committed against political and religious leaders. But if you had massacred innocent mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, brothers, sisters, children, babies, a whole nation, you were worthy of a seat in parliament to govern the country. 30 years since we have the forgiven. Those who have butchered our nation and our people and given them the power to rule over, over us and lead us to the free falling disaster that is ransacking and, 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 and butchering once again, the live flesh of the Lebanese people. What really what an eerily appropriate date to be holding a symposium that asks the question, how did we get here? So how did we get here? And more importantly, do you know, do you, collective you, do we really know how bad here is? Because no matter what you think you know, even those who are living it day to day, it's worse than we'd ever imagined. How did we get to a bankrupt banking system, whereas it was one of our pride sectors, the pillar of the economy? How, how did we become a state defaulting on our debt, which is the lowest rating in any sovereign state in terms of credit worthiness? How did we get to a population 
where an estimated 60% are below the poverty line, while we ranked for the majority of our contemporary history as one of the most prosperous countries in the world, if not certainly in the region. So please, let me give you the data. The GDP of Lebanon went from 52 billion US dollars in 2019, all the way down to $33.8 billion in 2020. That's a 36% drop in one goddamn year. So how is it possible that in 2020, we were back to the level of our GDP of 2008 using World Bank numbers? We fell 12 years behind in a matter of a few weeks. 12 years. I'm gonna go on. According to the World Bank, our 2020 GDP per capita was, and I have it here, 4,636.9 US dollars. That is 37% of the world's average. Let me explain what that means. We got to being 63% below the average GDP country in the world. How did that happen? These are the qualifications of an objectively poor country. How did we get to be such a poor country when our diaspora represents some of the most successful immigrant communities in the developed world? How can it be that two out of three of our neighboring states rank in the top tier of the world while we rank in the bottom 10%? Our GDP per capita in 2020 was 37% of the world's average while Cyprus was at 241% of the world average, and Israel was at 268% of the world average. In 2020, Cyprus's GDP per capita is 6.5 times that of Lebanon, and Israel's is seven times. And today, it is estimated to be probably 10 times. You think that's scandalous? Wait till you hear this next piece of data. As I said, in 2020, our GDP per capita was 4,636.9 US dollars. Can you take a wild guess Everyone listening today, can you take a wild guess what it was in 1992? 2020, 4,636.9. What was it in 1992? What do you reckon? Was it higher or was it lower? In 1992, the GDP per capita of Lebanon was higher than that of 2020 at 4,767 US dollars. Can you hear what I'm saying? As a country, we are back to the GDP per capita that we had prior to 1992. They brought us back to the starting point, 30 years of lost wealth. The political class did not create a single iota of additional wealth per citizen. Today, our economic, social, and financial state is worse than a country that has just come out of 15 years of devastating civil war in 1990. How many countries are, were better off in 1992 than they are today, even in the third world. Very rare. Back then, we did not have a bankrupt uh, banking system. We did not have such a crippling debt. People's life savings were protected in the banks by a supposedly solid banking system, despite years of bloodshed, trauma, and war. Whereas now, 100 billion plus of people's life savings in US dollars have evaporated and are trapped merely as a computer entry in a, in a, in a zombie um, banking system. They destroyed the main pillar of the Lebanese economy. They impoverished a whole nation of people whose only fault, and I am one of them, all my life savings are in a bank in Beirut, is that we chose to live in our own country, that we've decided not to Im immigrate or expatriate ourselves. What does it say about us when we know that we were ba way better off in 1992 when the country was totally demolished and blown to smithereens? One of the biggest problems in post-war Lebanon was the demolished infrastructure because of the war. But guess what? 28 whopping years later, in 2017, 2018, the World Economic Forum ranked Lebanon, that's 28 years after the end of the war, 130 out of 137 countries in terms of quality of overall infrastructure. Meaning they estimate that 95% of the world has better infrastructure than we do. So what have they done in 30 goddamn years? What have they done? In 2017, 2018, that same report from the World uh, uh, Economic Forum um, ranked us as the third worst country in terms of quality of electricity supply. 
which is once again prior to any of the madness that we're currently living in. Behind, by the way, Haiti, Nigeria, and Yemen, respectively. Can you fathom how much of a political failure, of, a, of how much of a failure on all levels this political class is? Even war-torn countries are doing better than us. We are a failed state. Please understand that calling a country a failed state is a very, very serious and severe stipulation. It's the worst situation a country can possibly get itself into. Companies go bankrupt, countries fail. We have failed. Off the bat, let me affirm in the name of um, intellectual integrity that states can fail at varying rates over, uh, over um, different periods of time caused by different uh, factors. And while there is no unified definition for what a failed state is as a country, Lebanon meets all of the debated criteria of the different qualification lists, according to both constitutional experts and common sense. So, and I know, I know that Charles is going to probably delve a lot more into the history. I'm just going to, I'm just going to segue into a little bit of a his, of, 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 of a historical point, and then I need to get to, 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 to the final part of this. Lebanon's birth is controversial due to the colonial factor that was very heavily present for centuries in, within, within the fabric of our political and social um, realms. But the, for the majority of its modern existence, Lebanon was more beautiful, more organized, more prosperous, more law abiding than it could ever have dreamt of being over the past 30 years. Even if from the onset, meaning in the 20s, there was a deep paradox that has always haunted Lebanon, which is the contradiction of creating this national unity in a multi-religious society where religion is considered to be the citizen's foundational public attribute, printed on his or her civil registration card and determining um, his or her predominant identity. While at the same time, the modern state was supposedly established as liberal and ostensibly democratic. That's a paradox that will come back to bite us later on in, 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 in decades. But despite this gnawing paradoxical flaw of sectarianism in a uh, democratic liberal society, which will always be seething in Lebanon, no matter the appearances of peacefulness, etc. After its birth, as the modern nation state, Lebanon's first decades were painted with the most positive hues of a modern forward looking state of its entire contemporary history, albeit bulleted with problematic issues. But without unproductively romanticizing that period because so many of us like to romanticize that period and fine, but there we have to state that there was a lot of work that used to get done and many figures, um, although were indeed controversial, it should be said that work was mostly getting done under a legally institutionalized charter. And we were developing progressively as a nation within a legal and constitutional framework. So there was mostly a state building approach for the public institutions without giving any qualitative assessment to any of the people who um, governed, any of the faces who governed, and without also putting them on the same level, because in my opinion, some were significantly more um, effective, uh, some were significantly more honest and more ethical than others. And, but, but, but basically the names that really appeared um, during that period like um, to name a few, of course, uh, Camille Chamoun, uh, Emile and Raymond Idde, Charles Khouri, Fouad Shahab in the, within the Maronite realm, uh, Abdul Aliyefi, Salib Slim, Ra Rashid Karami, Riyad Salih in the Sunni realm, uh, Sabri Hamedi, Kamil Al Asad, uh, Qazim Al Khalil, Adil Asairan within the Shia realm, and of course, Majid Arslin and Kamal Jumlat within the Druze realm. Uh, the latter, by the way, being the only one who remained dynastically in the war. But but the, the period of those people created the seeming um, apparatus of a state. And there were institutions. And if you wanted to govern, you get into the state. But because the Lebanese state was created mostly after a series 
of arrangements were reached between the local political elite and the French mandatory power back then, French mandate, and not a consequence of, say, um, anti-colonial mobilization, like popular mobilization, a narrative, resultantly a narrative of national unity was not forged in the collective struggle. And, and when the country was destabilized, whenever a country got destabilized, we saw the eruption of tens of narratives that were so much more powerful than the national un unity narrative. It should be known that all countries pass through difficult times, but it doesn't mean that if we pass through a difficult time, the country must crumble, but we crumbled. We crumbled. The Civil War era saw the emergence of, a mil of militia leaders and warlords, none of whom, with the exception of Jean Blatt, had ever participated in governing Lebanon before the war. The Civil War led to the disappearance of, of the founding political class and the appearance of a new war class made up of militiamen who will spend years attacking, undermining, and weakening the state institutions during the war. Names like Jaja, Hbeya. Jmail, Jumblat, Berri, Nasrallah, Aoun are mostly names that came to power during the era of the civil war. And they are the names that are still here today. They carried weapons, they waged the bloodiest battles at their own whim in the name of sectarian battles. People of all confessions were massacred on the basis of an identity card where the confession was printed, which was the doing of every single militia leader. Again, everybody paid the price. One would say that this is the nature of war, but is it the nature of post-war to exonerate the butchers and award them with governing posts, handing them the reins of the country, which once again is the anniversary of that day today. The original sin is that those who destroyed the state and the country during 15 years of civil war are those who took over the state and the country after the war. With of course some not being there from the beginning who joined later, etc. but you get the gist. We moved on from 15 years of civil war at the hands of a bunch of murderous militiamen. And instead of holding them accountable, we upgraded them from warlords to statesmen. Of course, with the only newcomer to the gang being Rafiq Hariri, who, whose vision to rebuild Lebanon was given through like a reconstruction mandate by regional powers. But he was the financier that was gonna finance this new system. So we have this cartel this oligarchy sharing the spoils of the country of post-war Lebanon with total disregard to any vision of nation building, any total disregard to any productive economic model or prosperity or growth. This new political caste took over and continuously destroyed state institution through nothing but sectarian and self-serving policies with total impunity, complete unaccountability. They took over the state and all the institution. They transformed them into a private business model, into tools to serve their special vested interests and their own political agenda through corruption, collusion, and clientelism. The first 15 years was um, the, the system was sponsored and controlled by the Syrian occupation with which the entire political class colluded, served, and collaborated with. The next 15 years, the system was overtaken progressively by the Iranian influence through Hezbollah, through other means. At no point in time have we had true independence or autonomy. Foreign interference played a key role in the fate of the country. What did this system do? They ignored the basic understanding of development and nation building, any real reform, contradicting literally the most basic assumptions of how a state works. And they built a house of cards. The dismal situation we are now in, and this is my conclusion, the dismal situation we are now in, the descent into the hells, the bowels of hell that we are living are the foretold and expected results of years of management, of mismanagement, of years of corruption, collusion with occupation, reckless denial, ignoring of basic fundamental problems that our country and our economy have been accumulating since the end of the war. For years, public finances have been in an extremely poor state, 
the government was spending much more than it was collecting in revenue without encouraging any form of economic activity. Most of the spending was inefficient and unproductive. The government as a result was accumulating unsustainable yearly deficits and unsustainable debt. Three years ago, we were the third most indebted country relative to our GDP in the damn world, funded almost exclusively by the, um, the, the co-signatories who are the Lebanese banks. For years, who, who are taking our money, the depositors. For years, the authorities have been holding to an artificial and costly exchange rate, ignoring the supply and demand reality, the huge damn trade deficits, keeping an artificial peg, creating a fake artificial lifestyle in Lebanon. It, a couple of years ago, an economist told me this very famous phrase. She told me the most, the biggest anomaly should have been, and, and it was half facetiously, the rate of BMWs per capita in Lebanon. We are doing so much worse than so many countries who don't have 50% of the amount of luxury cars that we drive on our roads. So they created a fake life by attracting hard currency, not, not through productive means, but through exorbitant interest rates that crippled the economy and increased the debt inventory and raised the cost of servicing such debt. For years, the authorities encouraged um, and promoted a flawed economic model that produced so little, nothing, and favored rentier's economy, uh, 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 idle deposits, offering them very high interest rates at the expense of productive entrepreneurs. If you had an idea for a business in Lebanon, like you wanted to start a recycling factory and you went to the bank and you said, could I get a loan? They would not give you a loan because it's so much more profitable for them to lend them to the central bank, which in, debt, which in, which in turn is actually giving them to the state, the failed state. So as a result, what do you do? You go build your recycling company in another country or you park your money to make interest rates. They created the lazy, the lazy economic aspect of our culture. And as a result, our economy became driven by financial speculation, real estate speculations, while the share of productive and exporting sectors in the GDP kept shrinking, employment and job opportunities disappeared, real growth shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. For years, the warning signals were flashing in front of everyone articles, hordes of articles were written telling people, telling the authorities, you're going to hit, you're going to hit uh, uh, rock bottom. But the authorities in charge thought that they can continue to kick the can because there's always someone who's going to save them. France is going to save them. The Yad Salim is going to save them. The US is going to save them because there's a narrative of we prefer to keep stability in Lebanon rather than actually venture with new blood and that the country will not collapse as a result of that but it collapsed. And this is where we are today. So rather than embarking in serious reforms and avoiding the collapse, they kept promising and paying lip service to change while their main objective was to maintain their grip on power, continue to share a shrinking pie amongst themselves, continue to impoverish the, impoverish the country and the population through organized and systemic theft uh, of the country's resources and our future and our children's future. What do you think the conclusion is? The same people are forming a government today. I, 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 the same people are forming a government today. Those who bankrupted us, those who, 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 who traded with our blood, those who literally have killed us are forming the government today. Do you think they learned any lesson? Do you think they're going to reform? Do you think they're going to do anything to actually implement some changes? No. So this is where we are today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Yani, holding tears the entire time, responding to the comments. Please use the Q&A if you have any questions, Sarah. You are amazing. Thank you so much for giving us such a, an amazing, powerful, passionate way to understand what's going on for a lot of us in the diaspora and for all, a lot of the international community that is also wondering, and the question that I asked you, how did we get here? Um, from a historical point of view, now I know you touched a little bit on the history here, but let's dive deeper with Charles. 
of on on that specific thing that you asked this in this artificial way of building a nation uh, Charles, please tell us a little bit more about that from your perspective thank you celine i i must say that i'm very happy to be part of this talk with you with sara and with adib and to answer the question that the talk has um, established as the core question how did we get here or many lebanese especially recently have been calling on foreign intervention as a solution. However, and because specifically our historical narrative silences many aspects of Lebanese history, including the mechanisms, the context, and especially the impact of foreign intervention, especially since the second half of the 19th century. We usually have a very positive image of foreign intervention and especially of French intervention because we have no idea what really happened. And it happened to be that this intervention started in 18, like it's, it was already there in the first half of the 19th century, but took another dimension in August 1860 when the French sent an army to what was then the different provinces that form uh, uh, present day Lebanon. They were under Ottoman rule. Let me try to uh, uh, briefly explain this foreign intervention politically, economically, socially, and the outcome of this intervention that actually was one of the main factors that led to the constitution of the massive Lebanese diaspora. And we need to keep in mind that uh, 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 we're very happy, we're very proud of our diaspora, but this is actually horrible for a country because you actually lose the main actors of change instead of being in their country, lobbying and working for change. They are doing that from abroad. So the politics, what we call in history, the politics of Western interventionism have been a defining element of Lebanese history, especially from the second half of the 19th century. The uh, big painting that we see is the heroic depicting of the landing of the French troops in Beirut in August, 1860. What did they, what, what were they doing here? Um, they came in the context of the sectarian clashes that first happened in 1841, then 1845, and took a very big dimension, uh, a, a very tragic dimension in May and June, 1860. What the national narrative completely silences is that the Ottomans, before the French landed, succeeded in restoring order. And the French came actually not according to the narrative to protect the local Christian communities, but actually to secure the silk production that was disrupted by the uh, uh, sectarian uh, uh, clashes in Mount Lebanon, especially that since the early 19th century, and because of this Western intervention, and especially because of heavy, massive French investing, investment, financial investment in Beirut and Mount Lebanon, the economy of Mount Lebanon, that was a rural peripheral area in the Ottoman Empire, that, that largely was a subsistent economy where farmers worked their lands according to ancestral uh, techniques and traditions. They mainly produce cereals, olive oil. This area is one of the oldest area in the world that produces olive oil. And it is debilitating to see that the Lebanese state has zero plans to relaunch olive oil. It is noteworthy to state that under Roman rule, Mount Lebanon was one of the major producers and exporters of olive oil in the Roman Empire. Let's go back to the 18th to the 19th century. So the French uh, invested and shifted uh, slowly. The economy of the mountain was opened to the global market with devastating uh, 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 impact and effects. Keep in mind, Mount Lebanon and even the neighboring uh, regions that actually now form what we call present-day Lebanon are largely a mountainous region with limited fertile soil. So what limited fertile soil these farmers had, this is where they planted their olive trees and their cereals. But to produce silk, you need to plant mulberry. 
Imagine that because, and as a direct impact of this French investment and the shifting of the economy towards the monoculture, as the historian Fawaz, Dr. Fawaz Trabelsi states, the monoculture of silk, 40% of the fertile land of Mount Lebanon was planted with mulberry trees. This was catastrophic for a region that is mountainous with limited resource. So shifting the economy towards silk, uh, to be fair, there was some years of prosperity, but after 1870, this new colonial, even though Lebanon wasn't under colonial rule, it was already part of the French colonial economy. And the consequences were catastrophic because unemployment soared high, the only active sector was sericulture, the production of silk, and it actually developed at the expenses of other sectors. And it, it actually destroyed the traditional, very prosperous sector of textile production. Let me give you a, an insight. The Sherwell, the traditional pants of Mount Lebanon, in the second half of the first half of the 19th century were produced locally. In the second half of the 19th century, the fabric were imported from Manchester to see to what extent this opening of the economy of Mount Lebanon to the global colonial economy destroyed traditional artisanal production. There is also another aspect of this. Uh, uh, to secure their interests, the French you heavily depended on the missionaries that were already very active in Mount Lebanon since the 17th century. And these uh, uh, missionaries, whether they were Catholic missionaries or Protestant missionaries, worked on uh, introducing modern education, of course, they established schools, of course, they established uh, very important institutions. However, they also introduced a new concept, especially within the Christian communities, the concept of a pure space. These missionaries came with the Western ideal of reform, and they considered that because, because within the larger context of this Ottoman ecumenism, as Dr. Magdisi says, Christian and Muslims shared exactly the same lifestyle, the same set of values, the, sets, the same set of social hierarchy, the missionaries considered that this is bad and this is actually an obstacle for Christian reform. And they worked in to, to introducing narratives of otherness and of difference that started to create this sentiment, especially that is very present among the Christians of Lebanon, of otherness, of not belonging to this area. This was one of the impacts of the uh, cultural uh, policies adopted uh, uh, that uh, uh, were uh, the outcome of the missionary um, activity. Also, we need to, to understand, that, uh, understand that the silk economy, there's also an aspect that no one talks about. Uh, but few historians about the impact of opening Mount Lebanon to global colonial economy through sericulture is that children and women were the main labor force behind the silk and they worked in horrible conditions. They were paid a quarter of what men were paid. And because men weren't really uh, 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 welcomed in the silk factories, they had to find other ways to sustain their lives and their families. And this is what would be one of the main factors of so many Lebanese leaving Mount Lebanon towards the Americas, towards Latin America. And as a result of this Western foreign intervention, politically, culturally, and economically, Mount Lebanon's economy shifted rapidly from an autarchic regime uh, to, to, to uh, 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 an economy that, uh, uh, re, that was 
very similar to, to what we have now, an economy that is based on importing and where production is neither backed by the authorities nor encouraged. Uh, and peasants, farmers in Mount Lebanon who lost a lot, tried to compensate by taking personal loans. This is the period when the first banks were established in Beirut because they had to ensure the transactions related to the silk industry with France. They, these farmers who, were actually, uh, who didn't use cash before the second half of the 19th century on a large scale now had to take personal loans to buy mulberry trees necessary for the production of silk. That was the backbone uh, of the economy of Mount Lebanon accounting for 82% of the mountains export. So this crisis uh, that happened in the late 19th century was behind the first wave of immigrants from both what is now Lebanon and what is now Syria, who were illiterate, unskilled, and single males who started sending remittances to their families. But this system really teaches us as we drew close to World War I, and the economy of Mount Lebanon was completely shifted toward exporting the silk and silk monoculture, and uh, 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 consider it like this. It, it depended on exporting silk and waiting for the remittances from the diaspora. Both are tied to external factors. It's something that we haven't learned yet from our history, that when you tie your economy to external factors, you are in a very weak situation. And as the context of World War I unfolded, both were destroyed. The silk economy stopped. No one will ask for luxury products when we have a war. And then because of the context and the different blockades that were imposed by the Allied troops, especially the French and the British, the money sent by the diaspora to their families in Mount Lebanon didn't arrive. Add to that that local traders confiscated and hoarded uh, uh, food on a very large scale. It is, it is terribly troubling, Celine, how what is happening now is, can, uh, can, we can find parallelism between what is happening now and what happened under World War I, when we have an extremely corrupt ruling elite, when we have major traders uh, hoarding foodstuffs and medicine from the population, when you have a, a population that, is, that lost everything, and this led during World War I to the famine. And because the narrative, was constructed around you need an enemy in a national narrative after the establishment of the state of Greater Lebanon. Instead of blaming the traders who hoarded the food stock and the medicine and the French who and the British who blockade the Mediterranean and didn't allow wheat relief supplies to be sent from Alexandria, the Americans who were up until 1917, neutral in World War I, were ready to finance wheat shipments to Lebanon. It's called the Near Eastern Relief. The French and the British completely refused. Why? Because they believed that, because they had their colonial plan to dismember the Ottoman Empire, because they believed that dealing with a impoverished and with a population that is uh, suffering from famine, it would be easier for them to impose their colonial uh, 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 plan and be perceived as saviors. So when the first history books in Lebanon were drafted in the, uh, the late 20s and 30s, the famine was blamed on the Ottomans. Of course, the Ottomans have a big share of responsibility. However, the biggest share of responsibility that led to the death of 40% of the Lebanese population back then, and 40% of the larger population of the uh, entire Levant area is because of British and French blockade and because of the local traders, the very wealthy traders who controlled wheat and the medicine who hoarded this from the population. So what history teaches us in, in a nutshell, is that the, um, the politics of 
Western interventionism and foreign interventionism weren't always very, didn't always have a positive impact on Lebanon. They resulted in introducing sectarianism and institutionalizing sectarianism. They resulted in dividing a once a society that shared a lot of common factors, values, and lifestyle, regardless of the religious uh, affiliation. They also destroyed the local permaculture that was the backbone of agriculture and transformed the economy of this region into an economy that depended largely on uh, 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 on external factors. This is in a nutshell that to understand what how did we get here we already have an example of a prior of a crisis that we endured and that we are now enduring for a second time for reasons that are terribly and terrifyingly very similar Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, we are having a very heated debate in the chat. Uh, there is a general sentiment in the Lebanese uh, culture, sadly, for um, colonial apologists and for a colonial uh, sort of mindset that is an internalized colonialism that we talk a lot about at the Slow Factory, where as we believe that the foreign powers came to civilize us, came to put peace upon us, came to justify our existence. And this sort of mentality is mostly shared by the Christian community in Lebanon because the Christian community had uh, white adjacent, if you want, uh, privileges uh, against other communities course, in Lebanon during history. Uh, we are going to dive deeper into that. Uh, I have been answering some comments in the chat. Um, there, oh, sorry, that's my Slack. There is um, a lot of, uh, of, of, of things to talk about here. But before we go there, I would like to um, turn to Adib. And, uh, and again, as you mentioned, uh, Charles, in your uh, presentation, environment and politics are tied together because it's land, it's access to resources, it's access to uh, power in a lot of places. And from Adib's perspective, we want to hear about what that, how that led into green colonialism, how that led to the situation that we're in today and the work that you do to repair that. And then after that, we will um, engage in some questions. And there is a heated debate in the chat if you want Shal to uh, uh, give some of your energy. In, in the time being, we are going to listen to Adib. And of course, any links that uh, you may have, Sarah, regarding the elections, if you can share them with the community in chat. I know that Dalil al Taura is an incredible resource. and has also promoted this uh, amazing panel that we are on today. So we will get to the elections as soon as possible. But without further ado, please, Ajib, uh, uh, you go. Ajib, you are muted. Yes, thank you, Celine and uh, the Slow Factory team. And thank you, Sara and Charles for, you know, putting things in, uh, in context. Um, for my part, I'm gonna be talking about the environmental um, sector which you know a lot of people say uh, you know in Lebanon we have a lot more problems like why should we care about the environment so so I hope that we can shed some light on that and to start off I'd like to maybe like just take a few seconds to remember that we are still in August 2021 it's been one year since the horrific explosion uh, happened in Beirut and uh, just kind of remembering the 200 like 200 plus victims you know um, thousands of injured people and hundreds of thousands of people who were left homeless and lost their um, their homes and their uh, places of work. And I would like to say that, yes, uh, my government did this, our government did this, and it is also, um, it's also kind of collective, our governments around the world. I mean, like, we don't live in a bubble. Um, as Sarah said, like, you know, like we are part of this uh, larger world. There are lots of um, influences that uh, uh, that happen uh, in Lebanon, and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, things that are connected with uh, with the outside world. So when we when we look at uh, some of the things that are happening, so 
you know, cities, not just in Lebanon, but all over the world, cities are not serving as well as, you know, as a human population and definitely not as uh, natural uh, beings and any type of other organisms. Uh, you know, from the urban heat increase to pollution, uh, environmental degradation, the lack of green spaces, public spaces, water pollution, coastal landfills, you name it. Urban areas are, uh, urban areas are flooding. And this is again happening globally. Um, this is a picture in, uh, of Beirut uh, uh, just uh, a few months ago. Temperatures are rising all over the world. So temperatures in cities are more than five degrees centigrade higher than they should be. Traffic congestion is costly um, all over the world again. Fires are burning. I mean, we've seen that in Lebanon, but again, we're seeing this all over the world. So I like to think of Lebanon as a microcosm of what is happening in the world at a much, much, much accelerated, accelerated rate. So we say, you know, like the IPCC panel says we have, you know, a little less than 10 years to avert climate crisis. I mean, in Lebanon, we are seeing the effects of climate crisis, social unrest, you know, like all of this happening in the span of, like, you know, like a year. So this is what people should be looking at. Whatever we say is gonna happen in the world in 10 years, it's actually, we're seeing this happen in a condensed rate in Lebanon. Lebanon's rivers are being dammed from Jannah to Msailha to Brisa to Bisri, countless rivers in Lebanon are being dammed without any scientific basis. It's all based on people in power, the warlords who have now become, you know, like uh, financiers and, and I mean, it's, and all of this is kind of upheld and uh, amplified by foreign uh, institutions such as the World Bank. So the World Bank loans Lebanon, which is again, a failed state, uh, a corrupt state, a, a bankrupt state, loans us money, loans uh, our government, which is clearly and very much well known around the world that for the past 30 years, this government has been uh, corrupt, has been wasting our resources, our money, and still you have institutions such as the World Bank loaning Lebanon money for projects that have absolutely no scientific basis. All of these dams that are being that were constructed and some which are being planned have no scientific basis. They are built on uh, seismic fault lines. They are uh, basically built on, on, uh, on ground that is porous, it's karstic. And so it's a very porous material that does not retain water. So large dams in Lebanon do not work. And so this is again being uh, uh, upheld. I mean, it's not Beijing. Attends. Adib, you have to re say what you said because you froze. Upheld after upheld. Sorry, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, you were saying, um, just repeat the sentence but when you were talking about the World Bank uh, funding. Uh, so, so what I'm saying is that, I mean, this is again like, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, do we want, you know, the French to come and help us? Do we want the UN to come and help us? Do we want the World Bank to come and help us? All of this, we have to say that if we don't fix these problems ourselves, like all of these foreign powers that are going to intervene are going to intervene with their own uh, a set of uh, uh, things that they want to achieve. And so we see that happening with the World Bank when it is financing uh, uh, a corrupt government and a failed state. And it's when it is financing uh, these large infrastructure projects that are destroying our environment that are uh, that and that are not serving their intended purpose air pollution is is killing us uh, and so i was saying like this picture is in beirut taken in 2019 this is not beijing greenpeace uh, came out with a report in june 2020 uh, which is called toxic air the price of fossil fuels in the middle east and north africa region lebanon is one of the countries that that spends the most uh, of its gdp on uh, on dealing with the effects of uh, air pollution and we top the chart in terms of having the most uh, premature death rate from the whole MENA region. I mean, we don't even have heavy industry in Lebanon. 
we surpass Egypt, we surpass Syria, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, UAE. I mean, it's just crazy. And then when people tell me, yes, I mean, the environmental problems and you're a tree hugger and who cares? And, you know, we have larger problems, but this is actually physically killing us. So I will start diving into a, a topic that is dear to my heart, the Beirut River. So this is the Beirut River in all its glory and in its, you know, in its natural setting with so much you know, historical and archeological uh, sites uh, around it. And used to supply us with uh, you know, fresh drinking water for, uh, for the city of Beirut. And now in the city, it's being overtaken by these invasive and exotic species. Some of which like the eucalyptus, which is a, a, a invasive species coming from Australia, was planted by the French all alongside the uh, rivers and uh, riverbanks and uh, places that they, that, you know, French, the French deemed unclean and undesirable. So how do you make them desirable? You, you dry them up. And so these uh, trees are known for having such an extensive and strong root system that they suck up a huge amount of water. And so they were planted to change the ecology of our land to change the ecology and to turn it into something else. But, and then the unintended consequence is that this is a very aggressive invasive species. So it has no natural predators. It has no uh, species that can graze it. It has no species of animals or insects that can actually digest the leaves. And so the leaves fall to the ground and they just accumulate and they're full of oils and then they become a fire hazard. So this is again, like an example of green colonialism. And this happened all over the colonies. I mean, in Africa, you see that like in, in, uh, in the French colonies in Africa, you see the same problems with the eucalyptus trees. And the fact that these trees are also what we call uh, allelopathic. So they give off a certain chemical compound that does not allow for other trees or shrubs to grow under it. And so it actively replaces our native forests and our native ecosystem. And then again, our government, our ministries decide to further add, you know, other than the concrete that was, uh, that encased the river in 1968, effectively killing it. I mean, as it's no longer an ecosystem, uh, they come up with this idea of installing solar panels. I mean, of course, and I think Sarah would agree, we are, I mean, I'm an environmental architect. I'm a promoter of renewable energy, but the location, the chosen location was completely wrong. You don't need to do these solar panels on top of an already artificialized, degraded river. This project costs 10 times more than it should have because of the concrete structure that was needed to span the width of the river. So 33 meters of these concrete structures were needed to support uh, solar panels, which could have very easily been uh, uh, put on, uh, on rooftops of buildings. So turning this river effectively from an ecosystem to an infrastructure. Again, dumping the garbage in the river by ministerial decision when we were facing a trash crisis in 2015. Dumping raw sewage directly into the river. Dumping industrial waste in the river. So every few years, the river turns blood red because of textile factories that dump their uh, uh, dyes into the river. And of course, all of this flows into the Mediterranean Sea. So I like to put the, in the slide because it, yes, it is a local problem, but it has a global impact. So, and this comes from my studies in biomimicry. So it's a quote by the founder of biomimicry, Janine Benyus. What if our cities were as effective and generous as a forest, providing not only for us humans, but for other species as well, an imperfect balance with the operating conditions of planet Earth? So to cut things, I mean, to cut the story short, we are proposing to plant dense native forests to increase the resilience of our cities. Because forests, urban forests, uh, help us in, flight, in fighting the climate crisis, in filtering air pollution, in cooling down cities. They also help protecting biodiversity, birds, animals, insects. They help us in managing urban floods and in restoring the water cycle. So by restoring the water cycle, we are actually allowing rainwater to infiltrate into the ground and recharge the underground aquifers on which Beirut city relies to get it, or used to rely to get its fresh water. 
So instead of damming and concreting rivers and doing all of these things, renaturalizing these rivers as is happening in cities all over the world will actually help us get to this uh, uh, water autonomy. Improving, I mean, urban forests also, of course, help in improving physical and mental health. They uh, are cost effective because they no, don't require any water or maintenance after three years time. They are completely aligned with the UN SDGs goals number six, 11, 13, 15. So really kind of like thinking of people, cities, communities, climate action, protecting life on land. And we use a very particular methodology called the Miyawaki afforestation method because it is scientifically proven to be the best way for cities to mitigate climate crisis. And since the 1970s, thousands of native urban forests have been planted all around the world. So why do I say it's, I mean, it is one of the, one of the best ways because of, uh, uh, um, of all of these uh, benefits and co-benefits that are happening. So not only are we renaturalizing and rewilding degraded leftover uh, lands within the cities, but we are also giving uh, like cultural value to them. So these lands that the system or the government or whatever you want to call them have deemed as unworthy lands, as leftover you know, pieces of, of land that are just kind of uh, left, uh, uh, left to die and become urban landfills, we want to take those and transform them into these urban forests and into these uh, shared spaces between humans and other organisms. So Miyawaki forests specifically are dense native forests. They work in any environmental condition from, the, from tropical environments to harsh deserts. They are fast growing and very importantly, they become maintenance and water free in less than three years time. We have planted the smallest ones in like one square meter in sidewalks. And the largest ones are hundreds of acres. And those are in, in Japan and Brazil and in Malaysia and India. So the difference between Miyawaki uh, 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 approach to landscaping and conventional landscaping is that Miyawaki forests are 10 times faster growing. They are 30 times denser, which means they can sequester 30 times more CO2 and 30 times more pollution. They are completely organic. So there's no chemical fertilizer. There's no pesticides that are used in it. They are very biodiverse. They rely on figuring out the native ecology of the place and using those species. So in 2019, we planted the very first native urban forest in Lebanon. And as opposed to the um, you know, invasive uh, exotic species that are favored by landscape architects and by municipalities, we planted it with 17 different native species from oaks to pines to Judas trees, hawthorn, sage, bailey, floral. So lots of medicinal species and edible species as well. This is a picture of our site. This is the Beirut River. So the Beirut River is actually a sewage river in the summer. So in the absence of any rain water, there is only raw sewage that flows in the river in the summer. So this is our site on the first day of planting. The trees are about 15, 10 to 15 centimeters tall. This is it five months later. And this is it two years later. So in two years time, we have managed to completely transform this area. This is another site in Zoo Musbih, the most polluted city in Lebanon with the highest rates of cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and so on, because of this power plant that we see in the background, which is called, which is dubbed the power plant of death. So we took this tiny uh, road median 200 square meters and planted it with almost 800 trees and shrubs. This was a few months ago. And this is another project we did up in the mountains, also on kind of restoring these landscapes that have been destroyed and deforested over not centuries, but millennia, when the Phoenicians were cutting down our cedar and juniper trees and trading them with the pharaohs in Egypt and building ships out of them. So we are reforesting those areas as well. And again, we come back to August 4th. 
So we wanted to do something uh, positive after, after August 4th. And so we started looking at the forest as not only an educational tool, but as a healing tool as well. And we started planting forest with the youngest generation and with those that were affected by the uh, explosion. So this is, uh, this is one of our forests that we planted in, uh, along with, uh, with an organization called uh, Let's Play Initiative. And their idea was to restore playgrounds of the schools that were damaged by the blast. And we came in to plant tiny, tiny forest in those playgrounds to get the kids, to get the kids uh, you know, working with the soil and to help them see this kind of like life and something that is uh, different that is growing in their playgrounds and that gives them new memories and new ways of actually connecting to nature. So this is it uh, when it was done, uh, when it was planted and finished. And finally, this is our remembrance forest. And so this was planted just a few weeks ago on August 3rd and August 4th as a way to bring a community together in Basta um, and having them plant in memory of the victims of the blast. So some of the families of the victims came. We just had a very kind of simple ceremony where we just hand wrote little notes and hand, uh, hand wrote the names of um, all of the victims, whether the official 218 names that are officially recognized or the larger list of 254 names of uh, uh, victims uh, who were not officially recognized because they are not, not necessarily Lebanese or they're unknown uh, or they're just uh, from neglected communities. And so this, this is the power that we have as citizens of how we can lead the change that we want to see. So this is the initiative that we started, the other forest, a nature-based tool for ecological and social regeneration in cities. And the idea is that by implementing these forests, we can regenerate degraded leftover lands into a shared space between humans and native fauna and flora, all the while tackling urban flooding, reducing pollution and urban heat island effect. So we're essentially working with nature to transition our cities to healthy and resilient communities. Reclaiming these uh, uh, degraded urban spaces, regenerating ecological uh, um, uh, areas and also regenerating social connections. And don't forget this, the power of civil society. So under enormous pressure, public pressure from Lebanon civil society and its diaspora, the World Bank finally announced on September 4 last year, the withdrawal of its loan for the Bisri Dam, which would have resulted in uh, the cutting of 6 million trees and countless agricultural lands and more than 50 archaeological uh, remains in that area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adib. So many questions and so many uh, disagreements are happening right now in the chat. This is uh, an amazing thing because, of course, the Lebanese uh, culture is not a monolith. That is one thing that we all know and the reason why we have been in uh, decades of war. Um, amongst one another. But um, Adib, one question that kept coming back is, A, how can we donate to your project? And if there is a link, please put it in the chat. And B, how much would it cost to implement your vision? And please save that question for, uh, for last. And if you want to put in some links here for the community to support your work, to support some of these initiatives financially, uh, this is the time. Uh, thank you all so much, Sarah, uh, Charles, and Adib Anjad. Yani. It was an incredible uh, beginning, so dense, so intense as we as it should be, and uh, and and so powerful. I, I myself have been holding back tears, especially when Sarah was talking, um, and also when all of you were talking. Actually, because it's so sad, <laughs> it's so sad what we are do dealing with, and there is a lot of trauma stewardship that the slow factory does which is essentially holding space for really deep conversations as these are as these ones and holding our trauma together and as you can see in the chat it is stirring a lot of trauma amongst other a lot of people and mainly because of the weaponization of information mainly because 
information and so-called documentation that some of the folks are referring to in the chat have been done by European powers because some of our documentation has not been funded, kept, centered, and so on and so forth. And even our own documentation is only ha has only been done in a way of story works, which is a very close, which is a term that was coined by an indigenous author that I shared with uh, Charles actually. And what are story works? Story works are a, a personal stories of indigenous nations and local nations and native nations under colonial power to try as much as possible to document from their lived experience, the truth, the reality, that they were facing. And so let's begin with this misinformation and the weaponization of information, in fact. And Sarah, I would love to hear from you. Um, how did the misinformation lead us to some of the conversation in the chat as, uh, at the moment, where first of all, the word white adjacent stirred a lot of, uh, ruffled a lot of feathers. The, 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 the idea that, that the Western imperialism did uh, not divide us, but came in to save us. The UN is, is gonna save us. Europe is gonna save us. All of this mindset that needs to be shifted. Um, Sarah, go ahead and just chime in as you, as you see fit. You're muted. Uh, thank you so much. I actually look forward also to hearing Char Charles uh, address this because I think it's uh, um, much more his field. But I will say this about the weaponization of, of any type of information or at least um, fake news and fake, fake narratives. Um, you know, a long time ago, before the advent of the internet, we used to be uh, they, there used to be truly journalists amongst us, and some journalists were particularly notable and extremely respected for their work. And, um, and journalism had a very um, straightforward, straightforward nuance to what, it, to what it actually took to do really good journalism. With the advent of the internet, um, you know, now we, you have six million journalists in, in Lebanon. And, and the fact that you have 6 million journalists in Lebanon, a, a, by virtue of just being human beings, it has nothing to do with our Lebanese uh, culture per se, it's just by virtue of being human beings, we, um, we're extremely emotional about our own narrative and we are very much, um, we love to contemplate um, the righteousness of our position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the wrongness of others. And this is what actually got us to crumble as a society because because when you have so many dis differences, uh, so many differences in the narratives, it's easy to break a very feeble ground. If your ground isn't really strong, it's very easy to break it, which is what happened in the 70s with the first, it started in the 50s and then in the 70s when, when with the advent of the civil war, um, you know, all countries, as I said earlier in my introduction, all countries endure terrible hardships, but not all countries crumble, right? It's a little bit, it take, take, take the same thing with regards to families, with regards to friendships, relationships. If you have foundational strength within the reason why you are building this relationship with this person or, or this community, um, it's not adversities that are going to actually crumble it down. It is the fact that you don't have a unified, strong narrative. And today, my most, my most important, my most, my favorite, the phrase, my favorite phrase that I like to use is take back the narrative. We have to take back the narrative. It is not just about taking back parliamentary seats and the presidential seat and ministerial seats and institutional seats, because we can repopulate those seats with people who think like those we are trying to get rid of. Within the revolution, there are thousands of, uh, I don't know, Nabih Birris and Gibran Basils and, 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 and Nasrallahs and Hariris. Like, it's not really special to their DNA. Some events happened in a certain chronological order that made them that made them protrude in leadership positions, but those people are still around. In, in you know, it, the uh, indifference with just a little bit of visions or identity, but the but the 
but 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 the narrative must be taken back. And for me, for me, part of uh, I, I definitely want to also uh, start talking about what should be our course of action because I know that some people were asking me that. But taking back the narrative, because who controls our narrative today? The powerfully um, extremist segments of our society. You know when they say, I, I, I would like to do this exercise with, with everyone listening today. If you close your eyes and I say, think of Beirut, okay? What do you see? Really, what do you see? Because if I say, think of Paris, you know what to think about. Most likely you're gonna think of the Eiffel Tower or maybe, maybe um, the Arc de Triomphe or something. If I say, think of London, you'll probably think something along the sides of monarchy. If I say, think of DC, you'll probably think Capitol Hill. If I say, think of China, if I say, think of Moscow, you're definitely going to see their amazing architecture. But if I say, think of Beirut, what do you see? You know what's the very sad part of what most people see? They see the mosque. The mosque of um, the mosque in downtown with the church in the back. When was this our narrative? When were we rendered to just being a sectarian community that's just getting along or trying to get along? What a poor, bankrupt narrative that I have been rendered with, with the entirety of my existence to just being a photo of a Muslim and a Christian getting along. I don't like that narrative because that's not our narrative. This is colonial narrative. And this is also um, regime narrative. We are so much more than just our sects and our religions just coinciding and walking together or trying to, but failing, but trying, at least the intention is there. I mean, we sh when you think of Beirut, you have to think of something so much richer, so much richer than just the mosque and the church side by side. Which, which again is not our narrative. When you think of us as the Middle East, who's telling the narrative? There is a very strong religious narrative. There's a very strong, whatever is happening with Israel type of narrative. And also your stance vis-a-vis -vis Israel is not even your narrative. Because today, if you wanna be anti-Israel in terms of anti-apartheid Israel, usually the narrative that, uh, that is upheld is Hezbollah and Hamas's narrative. Where is our narrative? I am, I am unabashedly anti-apartheid, unabashedly anti the racist, ch child-killing, murderous regime of Israel. But it does not mean that my narrative is Hezbollah or Hamas's narrative. More than that, our identity, taking back the country, taking back the country in the name of what? In the name of what narrative? When I stand for human rights and I stand for environmental right, and I stand for all types of rights to be upheld under, un, equ equitably under, under a, a fair constitution. W what is my end goal? Take back the narrative is one of the most important things that we need to do. Because when we're going to the elections and, and a lot of people are placing so much weight on the election, and I have to say this, it is one of the many battles. It's not the essential battle. Parliamentary elections is one of many battles. Because if, if elections don't happen, what do we do? We stay at home, we wait, we wait until they decide to like form a government and do elections. What are we doing? Honestly, the work that Adib is doing and the work that Charles is doing, this is taking back the narrative in so many ways, putting their money where their mouths where their mouths are, regardless of what this goddamn regime decides to do with election dates or whatnot. And so as a result, I need to say this. It is really imperative to work on, on, on three priority fields. The first one, um, the first one is the narrative. But the narrative is: do we fundamentally agree? on our principles, on our ethics, on the moral foundations of what Lebanon is. Because being against Jibran Basil, Michel Aoun, Nabih Birri, Hassan Nasrallah, Saad Al-Hariri, Walid Jumblat is not enough. You can't build a country on the basis of a sanctioned vote. The pro you can't go to the election uh, booth and say you're voting against something. You need to be voting for something. 
What are we voting for? Of course, we're not going to all agree. And this is one of the very important um, um, terminologies that I like to use. I've said this before, um, that this is not for me, for me, I, I'm speaking in my name. And I know that a lot of people will join their, their um, names to mine in, in, in that spirit. For me, it's not, a, it's not an electoral or a political battle. This is a moral battle. A moral battle because for me, those people who are in the regime morally don't represent me, not just politically. I wouldn't have had such a staunch visceral problem with them if we just had political uh, di differences in our opinions. I have a moral difference. I morally, morally believe that I cannot subsist with them in the same government. When you have, when you have um, Joe Ai'i who spent, supposedly his phone was still ringing right after the explosion and his body was under the rubble and his mother, his poor mother, Madame, Madame Nuhad Ai'i, she went and she was beseeching the authorities to look because the phone was ringing to look within the radar, the telecom system, to where his phone was, because maybe there's a chance that he might be alive under the rubble. You know what they told her? They said, we don't have electricity to look for him. We're gonna wait for tomorrow morning's dawn light so that we start looking for him. I am morally, morally opposed to those people. Morally opposed, not just politically opposed not just economically opposed. It's not their policies that have harmed me. It's the fact that they are on top of being criminal, on top of being traitors, on, uh, on top of being criminal and murderous, they are traitors because they have collaborated, colluded and worked with the occupation. And they have done all of that with zero ethics and zero principles. So I have a moral problem with this and this is the narrative that I am adopting. But at the same time, I also have to say that we also morally, as Lebanese people, have a moral responsibility towards each other. Because with the disappear, if by some strike, uh, a, a stroke of a magic wand, I'm able to actually make all of the oligarchs disappear overnight. What guarantees that morality will be upheld? Right? Because we know we, we have been seeing how medication has been disappearing from, um, uh, uh, subsidized medication has been disappearing and being hoarded in warehouses by people who are working in the private sector. So a lot of them are affiliated to, to the politicians, but a lot of them are just Lebanese nationals like you and I. I like to give the example of a long time ago when uh, Saudi or, or Khaliji nationals used to come and, and, and visit Lebanon they used to be constantly priced a different price than you and I. I'm morally objected. I find this morally abject. Why is it that if I order a bottle of champagne, I get charged $300, but a Saudi guy gets charged $2,500? That's, that's, a, that's a moral combat. That's a moral battle. So what are we morally all here together to do? Because, because the narrative is important. The fact that we shouldn't let anyone else tell our story, but it, but also, also, um, it, it is indispensable, in my opinion, to understand that the over that overthrowing this regime, or at least initiating the process necessary to overthrow this regime, is top priority. If somebody is trying to be a little lukewarm about the fact that, yeah, this is what we're going to do. We hate them, but, you know, it's better to be. This, this fatalistic approach is part of the original sin of why this would fail. Narrative, the fact that we must agree that everyone must go. And then third part, an economic emergency plan. And the reason why I talked so much about the economic emergency, about the economic um, dire situation, is because there are many people who underestimate how that will play out in terms of change. There, it, it, is, it, it is impossible, it is impossible to effectively inspire the idea of change if we are not directly addressing the economic needs of people. 
and 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 boycott. Okay, yeah, we must boycott this political class. We must stop the appeasement with the criminal political class, which has led the country to to this godforsaken disaster, which has no intention or capacity to change course. But but the economy is extremely important to address head on rescue operation of the economy with a plan is extremely important extremely important and on that note i just want to uh, insert here that what you're saying is that if we were to take all of the ruling class what are the ethics that are that are unifying us and charles i would love to jump in for you to talk to us a little bit about that because again in the chat i would love to just bring your attention again to the chat there is a big debate regarding all of these ideas being perceived as like the 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 the, the progressive left the, the academic left the, uh, as what we're talking about here even the mention of colonialism as i said earlier has been ruffling a lot of feathers somehow we are agreeing on environmentalism so what i'm looking at in the chat a lot of people are resonating with what you're saying, Sarah, regarding the economic uh, reform that we need to look into and addressing like the, the economic collapse first. Um, but somehow on our identity, we are still that divided. We are still uh, unclear of what are the ethics regarding our ethnicity, our identity. And I just want to turn to Charles. And then uh, again, I would love to hear from Adib a little bit after that. But Charles, please go ahead. And Sarah, I'll come back to you. Thank you so much. You are muted. Let me, thank you, Celine. Let me first uh, uh, explain that reclaiming and taking back the narrative is a tool of liberation and is key in state building to build a sovereign independent state. Misinformation has been at the core of the Lebanese historical narrative, the official one or the different little narratives that are particular to every religious community. This official narratives, this official narrative disregards factual history and upholds fiction as history. What our students learn at school that is related to Lebanese history is mostly fiction or oversimplified history. This divisive history, this profoundly divisive history is a narrative, historical narrative is the regime's narrative. And this is very important that by upholding this narrative, and as Sarah says, this very reducing, reductive narrative of this is only a, Christian, a, 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 kin, a country of communities of Christian and Muslim living side by side and not together. This is not only, this is also, it has roots in the colonial and orientalist movement that was very present in the second half of the 19th century culturally and contributed in actually producing one of the first history books about the region. We should keep in mind, in mind that uh, 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 colonialism produced books that told our history. And it is only recently that historians, whether Lebanese or from the region, are reclaiming and re shuffling history to put it in the proper context. This reductive, this divisive uh, narrative is reductive. It, it reduces us to Christian and Muslims, as simple as that. It justifies sectarianism. It also installs sectarian fear in the subconscious. It has a psychological dimension that is very important. It also justifies the authority of the religious establishment whether Christian or Muslim or Druze, it also justifies, and this is the absolute danger, the power and authority of the sectarian leaders. And also it makes citizens prisoners of the past. And this is where actually we need to put this question of identity and ethnicity. And, 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 and of course, it is still profoundly uh, uh, controversial in Lebanon. And no one can claim to have one clear answer about who we are. Maybe we should be at peace with diversity as being one of the key factors of this Lebanese identity. It's not up to us as historians to say that. And, and what is profoundly dangerous is that history is used to justify 
either the existence of the country or which is also as dangerous or to justify that Lebanon is actually a historical mistake. This is profound nonsense. This is profound nonsense. And the two different narratives that are battling in Lebanon, Lebanon is a state that exists, that has been here for thousands of years, or Lebanon is a historical mistake, are basically nonsense because history shouldn't be used to justify a country. What justifies a country, and as Sarah said, is the set of moral values and ethics that define uh, uh, belonging uh, uh, to, to a broader sense of a community and a country. And one of the uh, uh, dangers of this uh, uh, misinformation that is derived from history, that is derived from fiction, that actually justifies sectarianism, we are actually seeing one of the examples of its impact unfolding in the, uh, in the past days, questioning or challenging a sectarian leader, which should be totally normal in a state and should be handled by the legal institutions, because any public uh, official is actually as he's here to serve the people and not to 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 be an absolute leader becomes instead of being dealt with through the legal channels through the institution becomes a challenge that is uh, uh, to the entire community to the entire religious community to which this particular leader belongs to this is sad the question the big question now is do we still want this narrative to justify lebanon as a buffer state as a state with weak institutions as a state that is porous to all kind of intervention not only western intervention but also iranian imperialism we are at a very difficult period in our history where because of our weak institutions and this narrative uh, and this uh, uh, um, nature as a buffer state, we are porous to foreign intervention, or we want to reclaim this narrative and slightly and, and, and start shifting towards building our own story, our own sovereign country to reach independence. Absolutely. And Adib, from your perspective, and again, I'm not suggesting you answer this question alone, but everyone in the chat, and uh, we're going to get to the Q&A very shortly, is asking, okay, okay, we get it. It's terrible. It's terrible. We get it. What do we do? We can't just vote them out. It's not going to work. We can't do this and we can't do that and so on and so forth. So Adib, from your perspective, uh, what can we do from an individual point of view, from a collective point of view? And then Sarah will talk about from a political point of view, and then I'll get to the q and I can't believe it's 11.35 EST, which means we only have 25 minutes. Let's try. And we should do a second version of this because it's impossible to uh, appease the masses with this information now that we have stirred the pot of uh, <laughs> we kind of have uh, ruffled all the feathers and as well as uh, you know presented evidence that shit is hitting the fan shit has hit the fan we are in a free fall what do we do now Adib then Sarah and then I'll hand I'll try to answer these uh, q and I mean, it's really actually just caring and actually just doing uh, it's as simple as that like just get down on the street, do whatever it is that you as an individual can do. I mean, as an individual, I tried to take on something that was much bigger than myself. I tried to revive the whole of Beirut River. It took me seven years to realize that I couldn't actually do it. And this led me to do the afforestation work. So I couldn't bring the river back to life because of the political agenda, because, you know, you need to talk to ministries and governments and the Ministry of Public Works and Environment. And I mean, no one really cares. And so what can I do? So I can work with municipalities. What can I do with municipalities? So instead of bringing the river back to life, I can bring back the forest ecosystem that was on the side of the river back into the city because that not only brings back this kind of, some of the ecosystem functions of that, uh, uh, of that river and the forest, but also it brings back a very important cultural aspect, which is we're bringing, back, we're bringing people back to the banks of the river. Whereas in, before 68, the banks of the river were a meeting space for people from different communities. When the, in the summer months, the level of the river was low, people used to cross from one side of the river to the other and meet and picnic and, and do all sorts of things. So you're creating this public space where people can come back and they have a reason to go back to the river. 
and they will not see the river, but they will actually smell it. And then they, you know, so we never say, you know, and but people come the first time and then they smell and then they're like, what's there? And then they discover the river. So that makes them either enraged or empowered or, you know, they want to do something about it. So it's really just do something. I mean, we saw it in the revolution. People were down on the street cleaning up trash every day after the, uh, uh, you know, like after we were demonstrating, they were sorting garbage. They, we sorted garbage on the ground more like in those few months than the government has done in their entire 30 years of existence. So there are so much that you can do and really like things on your own, but also so many incredible, incredible collectives that you should just join and help and not only donate. I mean, if you're not, if you're not in Lebanon, donate, but if you're in Lebanon, there's so much that you can do and that will help you not sink in the despair that I see all of my friends sinking into and wanting to leave because they don't have something tying them or something driving them. So I really urge you to just kind of like do something yourself. Thank you so much, Adib. I resonate with everything that you're saying. Let's do everything we can with what we have. That has been our mantra, whether we're in the diaspora or locally in Lebanon, creating bridges between one another. This is the hope and the goal of, the, of this symposium. Sarah, what can we do on a political level, on a global level? Any links that you can share with us uh, to uh, uh, help us understand our power within the next political uh, elections? Yes, of course. I actually have a few a few things to say. There is a difference between those who are there is a difference between obviously those who are here and those who are outside. Uh, those who are vying for leadership positions and those who want to support those vying for leadership positions. So there are it's it's, it's different. We I, it's not a it's not a one size fits all type of thing. Um, First of all, understanding theoretically what needs to be done is very important. And this is what I'm going to spend a little bit, a couple of minutes explaining. When I talked about the economy, okay, any type of political change, any type of community or country vying for a type of political change, if they don't accompany that, that, that hope for change, for political change with an economic plan will fail will fail no matter what. So when we used to talk about preparing for a transitional government with like dual mission, this was the hope that we would get, a, a, that we would be able to rescue the economy with an IMF plan and at the same time organize elections to renew the political class, right? The key word today, the key word today of the solution is liquidity. We are abundantly and sorely lacking in US dollar or in hard currency liquidity. And we cannot and should not, um, we are unable, it's actually been stopped. Uh, the central bank reserves have been completely sucked dry because um, anyway, these were debts to depositors. The country was being upheld in sort of, in trying to like not get it to sink by utilizing my money and your money, literally. That's why I'm not able to access my, my savings. That's why you are not able to access your savings. So, they, so their plan was to keep the, the country afloat for X amount of months by, by actually taking the money, the debts that, that they owe to us depositors and like upholding the subsidies, et cetera. If, you don't, if we don't understand the past 30 years, just what they've done over the past year and a half is already not understanding how change should be um, vied for. What they did is not only criminal because they did not at all try to see eye to eye. They did not even try to implement reforms. They did not even fake. You know how we say fake it till you make it. They did not even fake the idea of trying to do something to salvage the country. So liquidity today is, is suffocating us. And, and the average Lebanese citizen or many of the average Lebanese citizens will strike a deal with the devil in order for them to like breathe. Strike a deal with the devil to get their mom back on their beds, to get a hospital bed for their grandfather, 
to get their child to eat or to drink whatever nutrients they should drink to grow up healthy, they will strike a deal with the devil. If we don't understand how dire the situation is and address it head on before talking about the bigger dream, before talking about, well, you know, stuff like federalism or, or, or which surely has an important part in the, in the discussion, but in like phase D, you know, or talking about like, yeah, how do we rearrange uh, this corner in order for it to look? Uh, people are starving. People are dying. Cancer, cancer patients are not getting their syringes. That is the number one crisis we have today. And I don't wanna go too much into detail because may, you know, but the still effectively the government today um, was completely sabotaged by the quasi unanimity, unanimity of the Lebanese political and financial authorities, public and private sectors. Moreover, and it is a shame that members of the same government of Dieppe also sabotaged it. Proof, if need be, is the complete lack of political will for any reform because all of those um, uh, dominant names uh, would pay dearly if you actually implemented reforms. Even at the level of the calculations of the losses, when it was a question of agreeing on the figures, the Lebanese camp, who was supposed to negotiate with the IMF, was so divided that they had a fight in front of the IMF. They quarreled amongst themselves. They, 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 I, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember the headline where they said, uh, it, it, "It's, it's, it's, it's as if we are, it's as if we are striking an agreement with carpet sellers." That, that was like something that one of the e, e, EU officials said. So what I want to say is that politics without economic e economics doesn't work. And there are many groups amongst uh, the opposition front who do not, who are not realizing the extent of that truth and who are not taking into account the gravity and the complexity of the economic dimension of the crisis. And therefore they do not realize that a political reform process will never succeed if we do not stop the financial and economic bleeding because there can be no stable and solid political reform in a context of economic, financial, and social catastrophe like the one we are witnessing in free fall. You cannot implement any political change if the population is suffering so much economically, financially, and socially. And likewise, the economic and financial crisis will never be able to be resolved without changing the political regime. So I would even say um, that if we do not face the economic, financial, and social crisis, um, the political process is going to be hijacked and by extremism and political chaos, which we are seeing. Those of us who are in Beirut, who, who are in Lebanon, are seeing the cartels already forming around the gas stations. These guys and their wife beaters <laughs> filling up gallon after gallon of, of, of gas. In the name of who? Who are you? What cartel do you belong to? Those are new cartels that are starting to be formed. In desperation, we will unite with the devil in order to make ends meet. So we have to be prepared not only politically, but economically. Any agent, any agent of change today must have an economic bailout as the main and the biggest um, point, and then the political bailout. And, 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 and generalities are not enough. Agreeing on the lowest common denominators is not enough. We need a specific action plan, a very specific action plan. Many individuals who are very savvy within the economics uh, community are talking about this and they tweet about it, right? But here is the importance of being able to encourage ourselves amongst ourselves to form this front, right? Because, because politicizing and organizing this opposition with an economic and political plan is the number one, number one step. Number two, an intense organized international lobbying effort that is already being done by people like Sidin Saman. I want to stress this since this is mostly an international audience, lobbying with all international bodies and powers to help us get rid of this criminal and corrupt regime is a priority because unfortunately the international powers continue to be complacent to continue to be complacent. While other in other similar situations of popular uprisings, like in Ukraine, 
Within a day, they were like demonizing them. In Georgia, the same thing. And number three, political education. And this city, and I sort of talked to you about once that I was planning, I'm, I'm, I'm developing a political platform for political education. And um, I, I will in due time hope to earn all of you, all of you um, to, to, to participate and, 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 and utilize this platform. But basically this is the gist of it. I'm, I, I'm happy to go another time in detail of what the economic plan looks like. Well, uh, absolutely I, another time in detail. I just want to do quick time check. Less than 15 minutes. ASL interpreters will leave after 15 minutes. But Sarah, we need to do a second round. We need to do a second round that's focused only on solutions. Because what I'm sensing and reading the room here, A, we're not going to have enough time for the Q&A. All the questions in the Q&A are a dissertation in and of themselves. So we are recording them and we have to do a second part because there's no way we can even answer one of them in a quick 10 minute um, answer. Two, we have to do this again because now we have assessed the situation, the context. We uh, have brought it to the general understanding. We are going to edit and provide this as a uh, as part of open education uh, on Slow Factory to start this, what you were saying, this political education. This is part of the political education. This is part of level setting with the community on certain things that are supposed to align us. Ethics, as you mentioned earlier, the environment, historical facts, information, all of these things are still, um, you know, we, we still don't align on them. As you could see from the chat, from the questions, every single question, I urge you to look at them uh, very quickly. They are in and of itself, like each of them are a dissertation and worth two hours to discuss. And I'm so sorry to cut you. I feel so bad. I feel like we need a whole day of conversation, Sarah, because everything oh. that we are talking about here is, is, has not been talked about in a way that's accessible. So that's why we are doing this. It's to bring it to the, to the, to the most accessible way possible that we can for us to level set, for us to very quickly understand what's going on. And very quickly, if we were able to end in five to 10 minutes, what how can we end on a positive note? I'm so sorry to be so uh, Americanized in that sense, but we do need a little bit of seeds of hope, a little bit of seeds of Atina yeah, So how do we start ending this conversation in a, in a way that inspires uh, and motivates something more positive? Sorry to be so Americanized, but yeah, we need something to keep on going. Uh, Charles, Adib, Sarah, very quickly, because there's literally 10 minutes. I'm so sorry, I took five of the last 15 minutes, but I just needed to wrap it up. So in wrapping it up, let's plant those seeds. And anyone in the, in the, in the community, I apologize. We will not have time for the Q&A, but we will do this again, where the main focus will be the Q&A. We are recording the Q&A within the Slow Factory. This happens a lot. Bear with us. Charles, don't unmute. Yeah, I, um, I think that uh, what Adib has uh, presented as one of the action plans is to re to save our nature because we are a deeply polluted country. And as Sarah explained, our society is in deep economic crisis. We are also in deep natural crisis. So maybe since this is something that we slightly can do without the state intervention, uh, uh, saving nature is essential for building a sovereign, independent Lebanon. Going back to our heritage, we are part of the area that invented agriculture. We shouldn't be in constant fear of f a lack of food. Going back to this heritage, going back to our native trees, native agriculture, saving again our rivers might actually not might will definitely help us and reconnect us with the nature and help us in reclaiming our country thank you adib plant some seeds of hope um i mean it's it's i mean for me the the work that i'm doing is political on it in its own way because uh planting a tree is a political act even though it's not seen as political act so it is a uh, it's it's quite subtle and it's um, it doesn't offend anyone 
You know, it's something, I mean, no one's going to tell you whether they're, you know, Muslim or Christian or like uh, following this party or the other, like don't plant a tree, like, you know, we don't accept. So for me, this is definitely like a way that we are asserting our rights and we are reclaiming these spaces, again, that the government or that the people in power have deemed as non-essential or, you know, not valuable. We are valuable, our lives are valuable, our biodiversity, our nature are valuable. And so, you know, again, like planting this tree and it could be, I mean, I saw in some of the chats, yes, our ecosystems in Lebanon are not just forests. So of course we recognize that in some places we don't plant forests, but we need to restore, you know, like uh, different types of ecosystems. So, so definitely point, uh, point taken. Uh, so yes, so do the political act, even if it's, uh, if it's kind of like a subtle underhanded uh, political act. Thank you so much. I just am writing environmental justice is political justice. On that note, Sarah, wrap it up. Thank you. Can I ask Adib, where are you? It's beautiful where you are. Where are you? I'm in a little village uh, up north in Roma. So some of the, the beauty of our, of our country, for those who can see, and of our historical architecture that has all but disappeared. So. So very privileged to be in this type of place. Awesome, great. So um, I, will, I will say this, you know, pluralism, which is that picture that I told you they, they're trying to pin on Lebanon or on Beirut whenever they say, you know, you know a picture of, uh, you know, a photo of Beirut and you close your eyes and you see that the mosque, uh, the blue, the, the, the blue cupola mosque with a, with a, with a church, like, Pluralism is has been, you know, harnessed by this narrative that I hope will be changed effectively to um, and upgraded to a much richer and much more beautiful and much more truthful narrative. Has shown the world that look, I know Lebanon is a message, as in the words of of, of the former pope. Like, but pluralism uh, it has also been a curse, right, in our nation. But it's only really a curse if we choose to remain selfish with our nation. We, I don't believe we can deserve to live a dignified livelihood in this land, in this gorgeously rich land, until we learn how to share this land with our compatriots. Our history is the empirical proof that resistance, resentment, and vengeance have no place in finding dignity nor in achieving nation building. A, a, a small, narrow, sectarian-based narrative will n always and constantly um, be a barrage to nation building. Every faction makes fiery speeches and they love to accuse other segments of society of trampling their dignity, talking about. Uh, I, I, I love to I love to say that the concept of like the rights of of Christians or the rights of Sunnis or the rights of Muslims, is 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 a complete is a complete hoax because what is it? You're taught there is no such thing as Christian rights or Sunni rights or Shia rights. There is such, such a thing as human rights. And you have the inherent human, human right to exercise whatever faith you want to, but it's a human right. There is no dignity that is tied to a sect. That is part of the bad narrative. But understand this, we will never be able to live in dignity as long as we wish to deprive any of our compatriots of that same dignity. Once we understand this as a nation, once we really grasp the importance of dignifying all of our compatriots, no matter how, how different or, 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 or colorful their beliefs may be, only then we'll be able to come to terms with the true meaning of independence and sovereignty. For as long as we carry fear and, 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 and abject resentment for any fellow citizens who are choosing different paths than we would have liked them to choose. 
we will never be independent of anything. And we will constantly be hostages to one of the most destructive narratives that our region has known. So here's to hoping that we are working day in, day out in order to truly celebrate independence in Lebanon by taking back the narrative, fomenting a new, rich, beautifully engaging narrative in the name of morality and ethics and principles, and building a country that we hope in our lifetime will reach the ranks of the first world of today. Thank you. Amen for that. I mean, I just want to conclude that the American Sign Language for Lebanon is this, three fingers, and it's the cedar tree. And to conclude on that, it's just environmental justice is political justice. It's the heart and soul of the slow factory that human rights and environmental rights are one and the same. And as we've heard today, <clears throat> it's also a human right not a sectarian right and, uh, and a hierarchy uh, built in hierarchy of different types of human rights that are on top of one another it's human rights and i love what you said sarah at the very end which is learning how to embrace plurality which is one of the notion that goes against colonialism and anti-colonial thought leadership really embraces plurality and again we said some very important things that are there's no one solution fits all which is again a colonial construct it's a case by case which is something the global south really understands and knows how to implement we don't really abide by these standardized rules of let's just do one thing let's just all vote let's just all do one thing that is a b c d or e you know it is a plurality of solutions and i think here in this um conversation today, we were able to at least, um, you know, uh, turn the soil, plant some seeds, <laughs> you know, uh, take out some some of the, the, the ravaging um, invasive herbs and species that are uh, not conductive to a constructive uh, uh, conversation and, and building something together really requires for us to level set. And this was the intention with this, with this symposium. I want to thank all of you with the bottom of my heart, Sarah, Adib, and Charles, Leah, and um, sorry, not Veronica, but uh, Jasmine. Um, I want to thank uh, our American Sign Language interpreter, Nick, Nicole, Colin, John Juan, who is also from our team here, Sarah, Adib, and Charles Anjad, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. We must do this again. This was just the not even the top of the iceberg this was like basically the steam above the iceberg as it's melting like it's not even enough what we are doing but it was important i am so grateful for you so grateful for these two hours that went by like this uh, thank you so much uh, all of you on the chat uh, for some of you coming back and engaging in constructive uh, uh, conversations, everyone in the Q&A who has contributed, we are going to be answering these uh, uh, questions. If you want to stay, you are welcome to stay for a conclusion, but uh, our American Sign Language interpreters unfortunately will have to leave us. So just mentioning that, uh, that I want to be uh, aware of that. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Leah. Uh, both of you have uh, Lebanese uh, 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 relationships, so you were able to understand some of the things that we were saying. Thank you so much. It's so important to render these conversations as accessible as possible so that we are all on the same page to be able to move forward forward. So thank you so much. If you must leave, I, I, I thank you so much. You, you can absolutely leave. For Sarah, Adib, and Charles, if you want to stay a little bit longer, let's take it to 12.15 if you want to just conclude in the way that you feel comfortable concluding, because I don't want to cut anybody. And of course, this is just the beginning. We can be talking for the whole weekend about this, and I know we will offline. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in from all over the world all the diaspora and all the ones who aren't the, dias the Lebanese diaspora who are just curious, as Adib said, Lebanon is uh, the perfect uh, ecosystem for understanding global issues in a very localized way as we, have, as we are holding all of the issues at once. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. My team, you can leave. I'm just gonna stay for a little bit longer um, and, uh, and thank you so much.